Good morning and welcome everyone. This is Grace Lee, Chair of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Uh, today is Thursday, August 3rd, and I'm pleased to call today's ACIP meeting to order. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Melinda Wharton to begin with our purpose and our process this morning, some brief announcements, and to set the stage for today's discussion. Dr. Wharton? Thank you, Dr. Lee. Good morning and welcome to the August 3rd, 2023 virtual ACIP meeting. Copies of the slides being presented at today's meeting are available on the ACIP website or will be soon. Additionally, slides are available through a share file link for ACIP voting, liaison, and ex officio members. A few notes on meeting logistics for those who are participating on the Zoom line. Please mute your lines at all time until you're called on for discussion. When Dr. Lee opens the meeting for discussion, please use the uh, raise hand function in Zoom to virtually raise your hand. During the discussion period, Dr. Lee will take questions first from voting ACIP members and then from ex officio members and liaison representatives. Please disable your, uh, your video, um, except during votes when we'll ask ACIP voting members to turn on their video. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is, at its heart, a public body, and engagement with the public and transparency in our processes are vital to the committee's work. For this meeting, we will be holding one oral public comment period today at 1.55 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. To create a fair and more efficient process for requesting to make an oral comment, we ask that people interested in making an oral comment submit a request online in advance of the meeting. Priority is given to these advanced requests, and if more people request to speak than can be accommodated, we conduct a blind lottery to determine who the speakers will be. Speakers selected in the lottery for this meeting have been notified in advance of the meeting. Members of the public can also submit written public comments via regulations.gov using docket number ID CDC 2023-0063. Information on the written public comment process, including information on how to make a comment, can be found on the ACIP meeting website. As noted in the ACIP Policies and Procedures Manual, members of the ACIP agree to forgo participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. For certain other interests that potentially enhance a member's expertise while serving on the committee, CDC has issued limited conflict of interest waivers. Members who conduct vaccine clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards may present to the committee on matters related to those vaccines, but these, mem these members are prohibited from participating in committee votes on issues related to those vaccines. Regarding other vaccines of the concerned company, a member may participate in discussions with the provision that he or she abstains on all votes related to the vaccines of that company. At the beginning of each meeting, ACIP members state any conflicts of interest. We're currently soliciting applications and nominations for candidates to fill upcoming vac vacancies on the committee. Detailed instructions for submissions um, of names for potential candidates to serve as ACIP members is now available on the ACIP website. The deadline for applications for ACIP membership has been extended and is now September 1st, 2023 for the four-year term beginning July 2024. By way of introduction to the topic of today's meeting, I'd briefly like to go over two different processes for immunization, passive and active. With passive immunization, the person receiving the protection is administered preformed antibody that comes from somewhere else. Uh, diphtheria antitoxin is still manufactured in horses, but most products for passive immunization come from human immune globulins, um, and, and now uh, some antibody products are made in cell culture systems. These antibodies can provide excellent protection, but that protection wanes over time because the antibodies that are given only last so long. Transfer of maternal antibody across the placenta that provides protection in early infancy is another example of passive immunization. In contrast, Active immunization that we see with traditional vaccines comes from the response of the recipient's own immune system. Thanks to immunological memory, protection is longer than we see with passive immunization and can be lifelong. 
Thanks to advances in biotechnology, we now have the opportunity to prevent infectious diseases with long-acting monoclonal antibodies. When used for passive immunization, these products can provide a level of protection similar to, see, to that we see with traditional vaccine, but for a limited period of time. They can be especially valuable when full protection is needed without delay and when a traditional vaccine is not available. And for some indications, the protection provided by a long-acting monoclonal might be, en might be long enough to provide protection during the risk period with a single dose. For example, for the duration of a respiratory disease season, for a critical part of a pregnancy, or for the duration of travel. CDC will prioritize for ACIP consideration those long-acting monoclonal antibodies for prevention of infectious diseases that are expected to address conditions that result in a significant burden of, of disease, uh, a significant burden of disease to the public's health, uh, are not expected based on the characteristics of the product itself to present uh, significant immu uh, implementation issues for immunization providers. I will say as, in, as um, that there's a large number of implementation issues that arise with monoclonal antibodies, uh, as you'll be hearing later in this meeting, but it's not due to the characteristics of the product itself, it's due to other factors. And, and are expected to be priced at a level allowing for incorporation into immunization programs. Uh, and with that, I will uh, turn things back over to Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. Before we get started today with roll call, um, I would like to invite Dr. John Farley from the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research Branch to uh, make a few opening remarks. Good morning and, and thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, I'm John Farley, Director of the Office of Infectious Diseases at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at FDA. So on July 17th, FDA approved BLA 761328, which licensed nirsevimab alip injection with the trade name Bayfortis. The indication was based on the data from adequate and well-controlled trials contained within the BLA and reads as follows. Bayfortis is a respiratory syncytial virus F-protein-directed fusion inhibitor indicated for the prevention of RSV lower respiratory tract disease in neonates and infants born during or entering their first RSV season and children up to 24 months of age who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease through their second RSV season. The safety and efficacy of nirsevimab were supported by three clinical trials, trials 03, 04, and 05. The primary measure of efficacy was the incidence of medically attended RSV lower respiratory tract infection, which I will abbreviate as MARSV LRTI. It was evaluated during the 150 days after nirsevimab administration. MARSV LRTI, the endpoint included all healthcare provider visits, physician office, urgent care, emergency room visits, and hospitalizations for lower respiratory tract disease with worsening clinical severity and a positive RSV test. Trial 03 included 1,453 preterm infants born at greater than or equal to 29 weeks of gestational age up to less than 35 weeks of gestation who were born during or entering their first RSV season. Of the preterm infants enrolled in the trial, 969 were randomized to a single dose of nirsevimab and 484 to placebo. Nirsevimab reduced the risk of MARSV LRTI by approximately 70% relative to placebo. The primary analysis group in trial 04 included 1,490 term and late term, late preterm infants, so born at greater than or equal to 35 weeks gestational age. 994 were randomized to a single dose of nirsevimab and 496 to placebo. Nirsevimab reduced the risk of MARSV LRTI by approximately 75% relative to placebo in that trial. 
Trial 05 was a randomized double-blind trial was active controlled with palavizumab. It's multi-center and it supported the use of nirsevimab in children up to 24 months of age who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease through their second RSV season. The trial enrolled 925 preterm infants as well as infants with chronic lung disease of prematurity or congenital heart disease. The efficacy of nirsevimab for prevention of MARSV LRTI in these high-risk patients during RSV seasons one and two was extrapolated from efficacy in trials 03 and 04 with demonstration of comparable serum nirsevimab exposures between the high-risk population in trial 05 and the trial, o, trials 03 and 04 populations. FDA imposed two post-marketing requirements. One focused on monitoring the prevalence of RSV variants, including the frequency of known nirsevimab resistance associated substitutions, and the second requirement to phenotypically assess certain RSVA and RSVB substitutions. Sponsor has agreed to a number of post marketing commitments. Among these, they include conducting the Harmony Study Extension, which will evaluate antibody dependent enhancement of RSV disease, as well as conducting an observational US based long term study of infants eligible to receive nirsevimab in their first year of life to assess the impact of RSV disease through day 511 post dosing. The FDA has determined that a pharmacovigilance strategy is necessary to support coordinated monitoring and assessment of safety information from data sources across both FDA and CDC. ACIP recommendations will be factored into the final pharmacovigilance strategy as appropriate. The full details of this strategy will be finalized in a separate document within 90 days of marketing approval. And this pharmacovigilance strategy may be modified as safety information accumulates during the post marketing period. We have FDA review member team members on the call today available for questions, should that be helpful. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Farley, uh, for the thorough overview of today's discussion. And also, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for outlining the post-marketing requirements and the post-marketing commitments. That was extremely helpful. Um, with that, we will move on to our roll call. Uh, for ACIP members, I'll ask that you state your name, affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts of interests. Uh, we will begin with Ms. Bata. Good morning. This is Lynn Bata. I am a public health nurse serving as the clinical consultant for immunizations at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Chen. Good morning and good evening from uh, where I'm calling from. Um, I'm an adult infectious disease physician uh, and a professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine's Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health and I have no conflicts. Thank you for joining. Dr. Daly. Uh, good morning, um, Matt Daly. I'm a practicing pediatrician and also a senior investigator at the Institute for Health Research at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, and I have no conflicts of interest, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Okay, we'll come back to Dr. Cotton. Uh, Dr. Lair. Good morning. This is Jamie Lair. I'm a family physician in private practice in Ithaca, New York, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Dr. Long. Good morning. This is Sarah Long. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician and professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine. I have no conflict. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally, president of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Kaling? Good morning, this is Kathy Kaling. I am a pediatrician and um, professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist. I have no conflict, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Good morning, Pablo Sanchez. 
I'm a professor of pediatrics at Yale State University College of Medicine. I'm a neonatologist and pediatric infectious disease specialist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Good morning. I'm uh, Kit Talbot, adult infectious disease physician, a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Oh, um, sorry. I'm having problems with my buttons today, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cotton. Good morning, Camille Cotton. Uh, I'm the clinical director of transplant and immunocompromised host infectious diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital and associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, I have uh, no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Grace Lee. I'm chief quality officer at Stanford Medicine Children's Health and a professor of pediatrics in infectious diseases at Stanford University School of Medicine. And I have no conflicts. <laughs> um, for our committee, we have quorum and so we are able to proceed today. For ex officio and liaison uh, members, I will announce the organization name. Uh, please indicate your um, if you're present uh, via your first and last name. We'll start with our colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Jose Romero, Director of NCIRD, present. Thank you. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mary Beth Hans for CMS, present. Thank you. Food and Drug Administration. John Farley for FDA present. Thank you. Uh, Health Resources and Services Administration. Grimes present. Thank you. Indian Health Service. Matthew Clark, Indian Health Service present. Thank you. National Institute of Health. Good morning, John Bio from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Thank you. Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Valerie Marshall, present. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to our liaison members, uh, American Academy of Family Physicians. Pamela Carter-Smith, AFP staff alternate for AFP. Thank you. American Academy of Pediatrics. Sean O'Leary, present. Thank you. American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book. David Kimberlin, editor of the Red Book, present. Thank you. American Academy of Physician Associates. Morning, Marie-Michelle Léger, present, AAPA. Thank you. American College Health Association. KV Chai, present. Thank you. American College of Nurse Midwives. Carol Hayes, present. Thank you. American College of um, Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Linda Eckert, present. Thank you. American College of Physicians. Jason Goldman, present. Thank you. American Geriatric Society. And Schmader for AGS. Thanks. America's Health Insurance Plans. Jessica Grubb, present. Thank you. American Immunization Registry Association. Good morning, Rebecca Coyle and Courtney Londro representing ERA. Thank you. American Medical Association. Sandra Freihofer representing the American Medical Association. Thank you. American Nurses Association. American Osteopathic Association. Dan Grog, President. Good morning. Morning and thank you. American Pharmacists Association. Kelly Good, present. Thank you. Thank you. Association of Immunization Managers. Molly Howell, present. Thank you. Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. Chrissy Moline Jen uh, Jeffel, representing APTR, present. Thank you. Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Hello, Paul C. Slack representing CSTE. Thank you. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Infectious Disease Society of America. Jim McCauley, present. Thank you. International Society for Travel Medicine. Good morning, Elizabeth Barnett, present. Good morning. National Association of County and City Health Officials.
National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Patsy Stinchfield, present. Thank you. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Bob Hopkins, Medical Director, present. Thank you. National Medical Association. Pat Whitley Williams, present. Thank you. Pediatric Infectious Disease Society. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning, Corey Robertson, present. Thank you. Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. And Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Preeti Marotra, present. Thank you. Um, are there any additional uh, liaison members who've been able to join and would like to announce themselves? Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to our main session for today. Dr. Sarah Long, Chair of the Maternal and Pediatric RSV Workgroup, will provide an introduction and overview of today's session. Dr. Long. Thank you. I'm uh, uh, honored to present a lot of work of a very capable committee and with uh, tremendous support of multiple people at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Next slide, please. So here is the work group, uh, the first page of the work group. Uh, we're blessed with the ACIP members. Uh, you'll see their names there. And Camille Cotton also is a liaison uh, from the adult uh, immuniza RSV immunization uh, work group. Liaisons, ex officio members, consultants, grade consultants, next slide please, and a, a large number of CDC uh, folks and experts and uh, ACIP CDC staff, uh, Catherine Fleming Dutra and Jefferson Jones, the co-leaders, and especially Meredith McMorrow, Myla Prila, and Pri Myla Prill, uh, Natalie Thornburg, and others. Next slide, please. We have previously presented to ACIP on nirsevimab, the long-acting monoclonal antibody against RSV. We've talked about the epidemiology of, and burden of RSV in infants, the virology and immunology of RSV, the safety and efficacy of nirsevimab, the cost effectiveness analysis, both from a CDC model in comparison with manufacturer model. We have shown you evidence to recommendation frameworks for nirsevimab and clinical considerations. Uh, where there have been any updates, we will present those data as well. And should there be an RSV maternal vaccine that becomes licensed, we will discuss that and we'll discuss it in light of what happens with today's vote on nirsevimab. But today, the sole focus is nirsevimab. Next slide, please. And that is because on June 8th, the US Food and Drug Administration, the Antimicrobial Drug Advisory Committee evaluated uh, and uh, took votes on two questions. The first is, is the overall benefit risk assessment favorable for the use of nirsevimab for the prevention of RSV, lower respiratory disease in neonates and infants born during or entering their first RSV season? And the committee voted 21 to zero in favor of a favorable assessment. The second question was, is the overall benefit risk assessment favorable for the use of nirsevimab for the prevention of RSV, low respiratory tract disease in children up to 24 months of age who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease through their second RSV season? And the vote was 19 to two in favorable um, in favor of a favorable assessment. Many committee members recognize need for guideline groups such as AAP and ACIP to provide additional recommendations on the use of nirsevimab. Next slide, please. On July 17th this year, the FDA approved nirsevimab for prevention 
of uh, respiratory syncytial virus, low respiratory tract disease in neonates and infants born during or entering their first RSV season and in children who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease through their second RSV season. You'll see the brand name of Nersevimab. Next slide, please. So the agenda today is the evidence to recommendations framework for Nersevimab, implementation considerations, clinical considerations, work group considerations, and proposed recommendations, and voting language, and a vaccines for children resolution. Next slide, please. The proposed ACIP voting language, so that you can be thinking about this throughout the presentations, is the following. Infants aged less than eight months born during or entering their first RSV season are recommended to receive one dose of nirsevimab, 50 milligrams for infants less than five kilograms and 100 milligrams for infants five kilograms or greater. And children aged eight to 19 months who are at increased risk of severe RSV disease and entering their second RSV season are recommended to receive one dose of nirsevimab 200 milligrams. Next slide, please. So these, this is our agenda. These will be our questions for vote. And I now turn it back to you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Um, we'll turn it right back over to Dr. Jefferson Jones, who will be presenting on the ETR summary for Nirsepimab. Dr. Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning. So we will begin uh, as mentioned, giving an update on the evidence to recommendations framework for nirsevimab. And uh, given the uh, concerns regarding the implementation of nirsevimab, those will be discussed in a separate presentation. Uh, we'll then pause uh, for any clarifying questions. So after the review of clinical considerations, workgroup considerations, and the voting language, at that point, we'll welcome discussion on any topics raised today to prepare for the vote. So Dr. Long has shared the two policy questions. We will first review the ETR framework for the first RSV season policy question, followed by a review for the second RSV policy question. And the age groups included in the policy questions of less than eight months and eight through 19 months are because that given an average RSV season of four to five months, infants aged eight months and children aged 20 months would be experiencing their second and third RSV seasons, respectively. Nirsevimab is a form of passive immunization against RSV, as previously shared. So during today, we may abbreviate this as immunization, uh, but this is meaning passive immunization. Nirsevimab does not provide active immunity. Active immunity results from infection or vaccination, which triggers an immune response while passive immunity is when a person receives antibodies from an external source. So examples include antibodies transferred from mother to baby through the placenta or breast milk. And another example is direct administration of antibodies, and these can include IVIG or monoclonal antibodies such as nirsevimab. The PICO components for the first policy question are, the population is infants aged less than eight months born during or entering their first RSV season. The intervention is nirsevimab, which is one injection prior to the start of RSV season or after birth if born during the season. The comparison is no nirsevimab prophylaxis and the outcomes are as displayed. Displayed are the ETR domains. Those highlighted are the domo domains with updates from what was presented at the February ACIP meeting. And I will review all domains and focus on the updates. The first ETR domain is the public health problem. As previously presented, this figure shows data from the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System or NERVS, which is our primary source for monitoring RSV seasonality in the United States. Displayed is the percent of RSV PCR results that are positive from participating laboratories. 
as shown in blue for the 2017 to 2020 seasons, before the COVID-19 pandemic, RSV transmission followed a consistent seasonal pattern with peaks during December to February. During 2020 to 21, shown in the orange hashed line, there was very limited RSV circulation until late spring of 2021, and then activity peaked in late summer of 2021, shown in the yellow line, and transmission continued throughout the fall into December 2021. The most recent RSV season is shown in red, with increasing RSV activity starting in late summer 2022, and RSV transmission peaked in October to November 2022. So to summarize, the 2022 to 23 season began later than the 20 to 22, the 21 to 22 season, but earlier than pre-pandemic seasons. And this suggests an incremental reversion to pre-pandemic seasonality with winter peaks. And I'm reviewing these data to highlight the uncertainty in when the next RSV season will start. RSV is the most common cause of hospitalization in US infants. The highest RSV hospitalization rates are in the first months of life, and the risk declines by month with increasing age in infancy and early childhood. Prematurity and other chronic diseases increase risk of RSV-associated hospitalization, but most hospitalizations are in healthy term infants. The work group felt that RSV-associated disease in infants born during or entering their first RSV season is of public health importance. The next domain is benefits and harms. There have been no updates to the grade assessment of the evidence presented in February, but some additional uh, data received will be presented. Pooled estimates combining phase 2b and phase 3 clinical trials are shown in addition to the concerns and certainty of estimate assessment per grade methods. These were previously presented. The estimated efficacy for medically attended RSV LRTI or lower respiratory tract infection was 79 percent, for hospitalization was 80.6 percent, and for ICU admission was 90 percent. No RSV-associated deaths were recorded, and this outcome could not be evaluated. The estimated efficacy against all-cause medically attended LRTI was 34.8 percent, and against all-cause LRTI hospitalization was 44.9 percent. The risk ratio comparing serious adverse events in infants receiving nirsevimab versus receiving placebo was 0 0.73. In summary, there is high certainty that nirsevimab is effective in preventing medically attended RSV and RSV hospitalization. In addition to preventing all-cause medically attended LRTI and LRTI hospitalization. There is moderate certainty that nirsevimab is effective in protecting against RSV LRTI with ICU admission, and that SAAs are not more common in infants receiving nirsevimab compared with placebo. Additional, um, there is, uh, additional safety data was provided at the Antimicrobial Drugs Advisory Committee meeting on nirsevimab. The most commonly reported adverse reaction were injection site reactions at 0.3% and rash at 0.9%. And FDA noted an imbalance in deaths between nirsevimab and the control arms, but determined that the deaths were unlikely to be related to nirsevimab. The sponsor has shared data from an ongoing phase 3B study known as Harmony. This study enrolled 8,058 infants. The age of enrollment was less than three months for 49%, three to five months for 24%, and six or more months for 28% of participants. 85% were born at term, and 50% born during the RSV season. The study is being conducted in France, United Kingdom, and Germany during August 8, 2022, and these results are through February 28, uh, 2023 and the study is ongoing. The participants were randomized to nirsevimab or no injection, meaning the control group was not given a placebo injection. The primary endpoint was RSV hospitalization, which was a lower respiratory tract infection or LRTI hospitalization with a positive RSV test. 
RSV tests were ordered by clinicians for patients with LRTI per standard of care, as opposed to systematically on all patients with LRTI hospitalizations. And participants will be followed for 12 months after randomization. At the end of the RSV season, the preliminary efficacy results have been released, which are being presented here, and this is with a median post-randomization follow-up time of 2.5 months. Preliminary results report an efficacy against RSV hospitalization of 83%, against severe disease, defined as an oxygen saturation below 90% and oxygen given, of 76%, and against hospitalization with LRTI of all causes during the RSV season of 58%. For safety, grade one adverse events reported to be slightly higher in the nirsevimab arm with 29% versus the no intervention arm with 25%. The rate of grade two and grade three adverse events were similar between the nirsevimab and control arm. These results have not been peer reviewed or published in the scientific literature. So overall, the grade evidence rating was moderate. We downgraded based on imprecision for protection against ICU admissions because of few recorded events and imprecision of SAEs because rare events are unlikely to be detected. The work group felt that the desirable anticipated effects of nirsevimab were moderate to large, that the undesirable anticipated effects of nirsevimab were minimal to small and that the desirable effects outweighed the undesirable effects and favored nirsevimab over no intervention. The next domain is values, and no updates are available for this domain. In a survey of people currently pregnant or pregnant within the last 12 months conducted by the University of Iowa and the RAND Corporation on RSV immunizations with CDC, only 33% of respondents thought their baby definitely or probably would get an RSV infection within one year after being born. Despite being unsure or perceiving RSV risk to be low, respondents were worried their baby would be need to be hospitalized if they got sick with RSV, with a mean response 4 out of 5, with 5 being most worried. And 70% of respondents said they definitely or probably would get an RSV antibody injection for their baby if safe and effective. The work group determined that the target population probably feels that the desirable effects are large relative to undesirable effects. And the work group varied in whether they felt there was important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes. The next domain is acceptability with key stakeholders, and no updates are available for this domain. In a survey of U.S. pediatric providers, over 85% agreed that parents need more information about RSV, that immunization could help prevent RSV, and that immunization policy should ensure all children get access. The American Academy of Pediatrics and National Foundation for Infectious Disease uh, through a roundtable have stated the need for safe and effective RSV prevention products. The work group felt that passive immunization with nirsevimab was or probably was acceptable to key stakeholders. For the feasibility domain, Dr. Jones, we lost you for a second. All right, trying to sound check, having a little issues with our mic. Is the uh, sound coming through uh, perhaps better with this mic? It's coming through on my end, yeah. All right, uh, we'll, we'll continue with this mic for now. Thank you. For the feasibility domain, considerations regarding the feasibility and implementation of nirsevimab will be reviewed in detail in the next presentation by Dr. Georgina Peacock. Overall, the work group felt that nirsevimab will probably be, e uh, be feasible to implement. The next domain is resource use, and our primary source of data was a cost-effectiveness analysis performed by the University of Michigan. I will highlight updates made to the cost-effectiveness analysis presented in February. 
The company has provided an updated estimate cost of product. The list price was estimated to be $495, and the cost for the Vaccines for Children program was estimated to be $395. Assuming your Sevmab is administered as 50% under VFC and 50% under private insurance, the average price was $445, and this price is not final at this time for our understanding. Mortality assumptions modified to include individuals uh, at increased risk of severe disease, and savings from not using palivizumab and those recommended to receive it were incorporated. Other inputs are unchanged. The number needed to immunize with nirsevimab to prevent one health outcome was 17 for an outpatient visit, 18 for an ED visit, 128 for inpatient, 581 for ICU admission, 24 per inpatient day, and 194 per ICU day. The cost per health event averted was $2,662 per outpatient visit, $7,473 per ED visit, $19,909 per inpatient admission, $90,000 $90,494 per ICU admission, $3,687 per inpatient day, and $30,165 per ICU day. The updated base case result of the cost effectiveness analysis is $102,811 per quality adjusted life year saved. The work group felt nirsevimab is, or probably is, a reasonable and efficient use of resources. And a full presentation for this updated cost effectiveness analysis is available in the extra slides. Next domain is equity. As will be discussed in the next presentation, the primary update is that if ACIP recommends use of nirsevimab, ACIP will vote on a VFC rev resolution for nirsevimab. National studies of death certificates found higher rates among non-Hispanic black children compared with non-Hispanic white infants and children aged one to four years. ICU admission rates for RSV among non-Hispanic black infants less than six months old were 1.2 to 1.6 times higher than among non-Hispanic white infants. RSV hospitalization rates are four to 10 times higher among Alaska Native and American Indian children aged less than 24 months than the rate in the general population. Studies of RSV hospitalization by race and ethnicity have differing results. The work group felt that nirsevimab would increase health equity. Displayed are the work group judgments of ETR for the first RSV season indication. The work group felt that the desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings, with a minority opinion that the consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences. And the work group recommended the intervention. I will now review ETR for the second RSV indication. The PICO components for the second RSV indication are children aged 8 through 19 months who are at increased risk of severe disease with RSV and who are entering their second RSV season. The intervention was nirsevimab. Comparison was no nirsevimab prophylaxis, and the same outcomes were used as the first indication. Domains with updates unique to the second season are the public health uh, problem and resource use. For public health problem, we previously presented that the work group felt that risk groups to receive nirsevimab for the second RSV season could be based on the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation for palivizumab for a child's second RSV season. We assumed nirsevimab to be cost saving compared with palivizumab. And those groups are displayed and will be reviewed later. To evaluate the evidence if other risk groups should be considered for a recommendation, CDC conducted two analyses, 
a systematic review of literature, and analysis of MarketScan National Claims Database. The systematic review included any studies that compared RSV hospitalization rates among children with risk factors to a healthy control among children aged 6 to 24 months. Among 3,825 abstracts reviewed, six studies were identified. Chronic lung disease, congenital heart disease, and neuromuscular disease were analyzed in these studies. And the studies indicated an increased risk of hospitalization for these risk factors. No studies evaluating other risk factors were identified. Given the limited evidence available in the systematic review, CDC conducted an analysis of the MarketScan National Claims Database for select risk factors for severe RSV disease during the second RSV season using data from 2015 to 2021. Using ICD-9 and 10 codes, we identified children with and without select conditions. These included chronic lung disease, congenital heart disease, Down syndrome, neuromuscular disease, pulmonary malformations, immunodeficiency, and cystic fibrosis, and identified children that were hospitalized with RSV. We compared the rates of RSV hospitalization among children with a chronic condition to children without any of these chronic conditions and increased rates of hospitalization were seen for all conditions. However, a primary limitation in this study is that RSV testing may be more common for children with risk conditions inflating RSV-specific hospitalization rates. Several prior studies have documented increased incidence of RSV hospitalizations among American Indian and Alaska Native children. One study found that rates of RSV hospitalization in American Indian Alaska Native children were four to 10 times the average rates of US children overall aged 12 to 23 months as uh, determined from the MVSN. These studies have been conducted in specific populations and may not be broadly representative of the risk in all American Indian and Alaska Native children. Findings of these studies do not separate environmental, sociocultural, or other factors that may increase severe disease risk. And some American Indian and Alaska Native communities are also in remote areas that can make transportation of children with severe RSV to an appropriate healthcare setting more challenging. The work group felt that evidence for RSV burden among children aged 8 through 19 months entering their second RSV season with specific risk conditions is limited. The work group felt nirsevimab should be recommended to the same groups the AAP recommends for palivizumab for the second RSV season. The work group also felt that nirsevimab should be recommended to uh, Alaska Native and American Indian children entering their second RSV season. And the work group felt that RSV disease among children who are at high risk of severe disease in their second RSV season, as described above, was of public health importance. And for the remainder of the domains, uh, all of the uh, work group domains are referring to high risk or increased risk as those groups recommended to receive palivizumab in their second RSV season by the American Academy of Pediatrics, or AAP, and including American Indian and Alaska Native children. A pharmacokinetic trial was conducted that randomized children at risk of severe RSV disease to palivizumab or nirsevimab. In the second RSV season, 220 participants received nirsevimab and 42 received palivizumab. Among those that received nirsevimab, two pharmacokinetic endpoints have been reported. The day 150 nirsevimab concentration compared with the phase three melody efficacy trial among late preterm and term infants that showed efficacy. And the proportion of participants that had an area under the curve, nirsevimab concentration above a target based on the efficacy trial data in term and preterm infants. And this was 12.8 milligram day per milliliter. Among recipients of nirsevimab, day 150 concentrations were higher in the high-risk infants who received 200 milligrams in the second RSV season, labeled trial 05 and shown in the right red box. Then in the infants who received 50 milligrams if less than five kilograms, 
or 100 milligrams if they weighed greater than five kilograms in the phase three melody trial, and this one is labeled trial 04 and shown in the left red box. For the other pharmacokinetic endpoint, among recipients of nirsevimab in the second RSV season, most had an area under the curve nirsevimab concentration above the target threshold. 97.7% of infants with chronic lung disease and 100% of infants with congenital heart disease had concentrations above that target threshold. For safety, no adverse events were judged to be related to uh, nirsevimab or, or palivizumab uh, in the second RSV season follow-up period. In summary, for grade for the second RSV season, nirsevimab may be effective in preventing medically attended RSV LRTI, but with a low certainty. And the prevalence of uh, SAEs was not significantly different in the intervention group or control group, but the certainty of evidence is very low. And no data were available for other outcomes. Overall, the evidence rating was very low certainty, and this was downgraded because of indirectness because of the use of pharmacokinetic data as a surrogate for efficacy. The, the population did not include children that matches the proposed indication outside of chronic lung disease and congenital heart disease, that the study was small in size, and that no placebo group was included for a comparison. The work group felt that the desirable anticipated effects were moderate, that the undesirable anticipated effects were minimal, and that the desirable effects outweighed the undesirable effects and favored nirsevimab over no intervention. No additional data was available for values or accept uh, acceptability specific to high-risk populations in their second RSV season. The work group determined that the target population probably feels that the desirable effects are large relative to undesirable effects, and the work group also felt that there was probably not important uncertainty or variability in how much people valued the main outcomes. The work group felt that prevention with nirsevimab was, or probably was, acceptable to the key stakeholders. And uh, for feasibility, uh, an additional visit to a provider might be needed for administration of nirsevimab prior to the beginning of the second RSV season. And the work group felt that nirsevimab was probably feasible to implement among children aged 8 through 19 months of age at increased risk of severe RSV disease entering their second RSV season. For resource use, the inputs were updated similar to the cost effectiveness analysis for the first RSV season indication. As presented in February, theoretical groups of children with increased risk were created with two, four, six, and 10 times higher risk than the general population aged eight through 19 months uh, as of October for beginning of RSV season. Compared with February, we created two scenarios to account for this un uncertainty in mortality in this group. As previously presented, we increased the incidence of RSV-associated hospitalization incidents and increased the mortality per hospitalization. For the other scenario, we increased the incidence of RSV-associated hospitalization, but did not change the mortality per hospitalization because of lack of evidence on the mortality per hospitalization. We did not increase the incidence of outpatient and ED visits, healthcare costs, or quality adjusted life years lost with RSV disease um, for these increased risk groups due to lack of data. The cost was updated to $890 of uh, nirsevimab per child based on two times the $445 per dose assumed in the first season analysis to account for the two 100 milligram injections needed. Baseline mortality estimates were modified to include high risk individuals and other inputs were unchanged similar to the first season model. Displayed are the updated results. In the table, the left column shows the assumed risk category. The middle column shows the results if we assume that only the RSV hospitalization incidence is increased and the mortality per hospitalization is assumed to be constant. And with this assumption, the cost effectiveness ranges from $1.5 million per quality 
for the general population to just under $300,000 per quality at 10 times the baseline risk. The right column displays results if both hospitalization instance and mortality poor hospitalization are assumed to increase. And with this assumption, the cost effectiveness ranges from $1.5 million per quality for the general population to about $25,000 per quality at 10 times the baseline risk. The work group felt that nirsevimab use among children aged 8 through 19 months entering their second RSV season who had increased risk of severe disease is probably a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. Like all domains, this is assuming increased risk of severe disease refers to groups recommended to receive palivizumab in their second RSV season by the American Academy of Pediatrics and also including American Indian and Alaska Native children. For equity, no updated information is available. As previously presented, equity issues differ by chronic condition among infants and young children. American Indian and Alaska Native children have, higher, have reported higher hospitalization incidence rates than the general population during their second RSV season. Non-Hispanic black and Hispanic populations have higher reported rates of preterm birth than non-Hispanic white population. And the work group felt that nirsevimab use would probably increase health equity. Displayed is a summary of the work group judgments for the second RSV season. After reviewing the totality of the data presented today and acknowledging uncertainties around the aspects of the data, the work group felt that the desirable consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings with a minority opinion that desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable consequences. And the work group proposed uh, to ASAP to recommend the intervention for groups recommended to receive palivizumab in their second RSV season by the AAP and American Indian Alaska Native children. This has been and will continue to be a huge effort, and we can only list a fraction of the people on the screen, but a special thanks to all the work group members who have volunteered a lot of their time. And I'll now pass it on to Dr. Georgina Peacock. Hi there. Thank you. Um, and I'm pleased to be here today to uh, talk to you about some of the implementation considerations related to nirsevimab. I'm uh, Georgina Peacock, and I'm the director of the Immunization Services Division here at CDC. So I'm going to go through um, a number of these different topics that are listed here on the screen. But suffice it to say, there are a lot of implementation considerations for nirsevimab. And I will walk through those. Some of them we have um, some uh, you know, mit mitigation strategies for right now, and others we are exploring um, here at CDC and then with partners out in the field. And we look forward to working with people uh, through these different considerations as we um, potentially implement this uh, new product. All right, so, so one of the first issues is uh, that has been brought up is the, what the definition of vaccine is. And so when we look at the Vaccines for Children program, there is no statutory definition of vaccine in the statute. When we look at the Affordable Care Act, similarly, there is no statutory definition of vaccine um, in, in the Affordable Care Act. Um, so uh, CDC has determined that nirsevimab is eligible for inclusion in the childhood immunization schedule and the Vaccines for Children program. It's important to note in this uh, area that some states do have uh, different definitions of vaccine in uh, their state statutes. Um, and this may affect um, the state purchase of uh, vaccine in places that are uh, universal universal purchase states. However, it does not affect the use of federally purchased vaccine in states. Uh, cost has uh, been discussed um, in the previous uh, presentation, but uh, 
it, this is a, a costly product. However, um, as you heard before, there have co been cost effectiveness um, studies to look at this. Um, if uh, nirsevimab is recommended by ACIP, it will be covered by insurance and included in um, uh, the VFC program, it, it's important to make sure that uh, there is equitable access to nirsevimab. And so we understand that the cost of nirsevimab is a potential implementation barrier, particularly for uh, outpatient settings or ambulatory practices. Um, there is in the provider agreement uh, for VFC providers uh, a uh, provision that if um, uh, a practice is a, it has both public and private payers that they do need to carry um, stock, so VFC stock and private stock, and we rec recognize that this may be challenging for some practices. We are working through some potential um, sort of uh, short-term uh, solutions to this as uh, the ramp up of um, inclusion of nirsevimab in the VFC program uh, would be occurring. And so those are some of the things that we're looking at to see um, what might be able to be done during this in introductory period. Um, one of the things that is, is helpful for this product is it does look similar to other routine vaccines. So it's administered intramuscularly with a single dose pre-filled syringe. Um, it can be administered simultaneously with other childhood vaccines. Um, there is a, a um, weight-based dosing to this, and then um, the storage and handling is similar to other uh, routine vaccines. There have been some questions about scope of practice issues, um, and uh, different jurisdictions or different states may have different uh, scope of practice statutes related to who can administer injectable therapeutics versus vaccines. We did do a scan of um, different state uh, statutes or laws to look at who um, is allowed to administer um, uh, the administer um, therapeutics. And what we found that is in most states, it appears that medical assistants who frequently do administer vaccines will also be able to deliver injection drugs. Um, there is some variability, but uh, this appears to not be a huge issue related to scope of practice. Um, there have been uh, conversations about uh, where uh, the these doses will be given uh, during the season versus uh, sort of during RSV season um, and the age of the infant, and just some information on hospital administration. So approximately 10% of birthing hospitals participate in the VFC program. Um, there has been um, a suggestion that this is similar, if, if it were to be given in the hospital, this is similar to what we do with hepatitis B vaccine. Um, what happens with hepatitis B vaccine is it is bundled into a payment model for newborn care. Um, uh, but it's important to note that hepatitis B vaccine costs approximately $13 to $16 a dose. And so um, it's anticipated that if um, this would be included in a bundled payment model. It may take some time for that to be put into practice. Um, additionally, in the hospital, um, there are, of course, needs, and actually this, uh, and I'll talk about it on the next slide as well, uh, no matter where um, the dose is given, it's important that there be um, communication and documentation of all the parties involved. So if a dose were given in the hospital, making sure that the primary care provider is aware of that. Um, there are some potential challenges about nirsevimab being entered into immunization information systems, uh, given that it is a therapeutic uh, versus a um, 
vac vaccine, and I'll discuss some of those issues a little bit later. Um, and again, if there is eventually also a maternal RSV vaccine that is licensed and recommended, that also adds to this need for communication between maternal records, hospital records, and um, ambulatory settings or, or primary care offices. Uh, moving into outpatient administration, so I already um, covered those first two, but again, communication, very, very important uh, related to uh, this product. We also recognize that an investment, initial investment by pediatricians um, who are unsure on uh, the demand for the product um, may uh, create some challenges, and historically, there is a lag in insurance payment for new products. When we move into coding, um, again, uh, because of the uniqueness of this product, um, there uh, are some needs to look at the different uh, coding requirements. So um, the initial uh, meeting and AMA decision around CPT codes have classified nirsevimab as a drug or a therapeutic. Um, that means that uh, currently it is associated with an administration code that does not include a counseling component, and it's not eligible for a standalone counseling component. Um, what I understand is there are some efforts underway to potentially um, propose a unique code for this product that would include some of the um, counseling components to this and then also the storage and handling uh, components. And so those efforts are um, uh, underway uh, as a proposal. Um, and again, there may be some potential challenges in recording the doses in IISs. So this is a um, picture uh, to, uh, to show you um, some of the steps that are needed uh, to prepare systems for administering a newly authorized vaccine across um, the United States. And you'll see uh, that there are um, a, a lot of processes. It does take time. And so you can see this timeline um, that uh, displays when different things can ha happen. It takes a lot of partners involved in all of these different activities. And I think suffice it to say the IT ecosystem is very com complex. Uh, there are um, different partners working on this right now, and um, we are hopeful that we will be able to get um, you know these th this, these systems into place um, so that this can happen uh, in a timely manner. Um, some more on uh, the IISs and then also vaccine forecasting considerations. Um, you know, because a nirsevimab is coded as a therapeutic instead of a vaccine, it could create challenges with internal provider ordering, with uh, provision of a vaccine record, and some of the interoperability and data exchange with electronic health records and IISs. Um, in addition to this, there are uh, some uh, forecasting issues related to the clinical decision support for immunizations. Because uh, the dosage is done by weight um, and this uh, the clinical de decision support part of um, the IT system does not have access to the patient weight, that could create some challenges with forecasting uh, doses. Uh, second season recommendations also may um, be challenging. And finally, um, the these clinical uh, decision support systems are unable to take into an account of a maternal vaccination history for forecasting of an infant immunization. So that's not something that may be relevant right now, but it's something that we need to be thinking about. Um, and again, you know, some special considerations. I think these have been brought up in other places, but timing of vaccination based on RSV season. So tropical climates may have different or un unpredictable seasonality when compared with most of the continental United States. Um, there is variability in different localities. For example, seasonality in Alaska is less predictable and of longer duration. 
and then um, you know those uh, that are going to potentially receive a second dose, um, defining those high risk populations, and then also clarifying uh, palizumab uh, recommendations in the setting of nirsevimab availability. Um, reporting of ad adverse events is also more complicated for nirsevimab than other immunizations uh, being classified as a therapeutic versus a um, vaccine. So if nirsevimab is administered alone, suspected adverse events are reported to MedWatch. If nirsevimab is administered simultaneously with any vaccine, uh, suspected um, Adverse events are reported to um, VAERS or the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and additional reporting to MedWatch will not be needed. And then I think finally, uh, you know, we all are um, thinking about um, the introduction of uh, nirsevimab in the context of coming out of a pandemic where there have been lots of conversations about um, vaccine confidence and demand. And, um, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, what will the demand be as this is introduced as a new product? It's happening at the same time as commercialization of COVID-19 vaccine. And then, of course, we have seasonal influenza administration happening as well. So, um, you know, vaccine hesitancy um, is uh, anticipated, and therefore, you know, there is, there is um, a need for counseling around all vaccines and products, and particularly as we introduce new products. Um, you know, obviously, this is not given as a, as at school time, but we know that there have been efforts to weaken school immunization uh, requirements, and um, some of this uh, also. Um, feeds into the vaccine confidence um, and demand type issues. Um, okay, and so in conclusion, um, this just summarizes some of the things that I brought up today, but there are considerable considerations for the implementation of nirsevimab, and I hope that this is helpful in sort of a laying out some of those. Um, certainly, this will be a transitionary period this first season, and um, I think we should uh, make sure that uh, all the partners involved in this um, are thinking through these implementation issues as we move forward, and um, hopefully, uh, you know, um, you know, make sure that that the product is uh, something that it has good uptake, and that uh, you know we have infants that are protected. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peacock and Dr. Jones, for that set of presentations. Uh, we are going to take um, a moment to take questions from our members uh, and liaison members. So we'll start with Dr. D Kathy Paling. All right. First, I want to say thank you to Dr. Jones and to Dr. Peacock for um, tremendously helpful and clear presentations and to all the teams and the entire work group that pulled this information together. One of the things that was highlighted and has been a grave concern of mine is the cost of the vaccine and so, or yes, of the vaccine. And so um, I would like the FDA or the vaccine manufacturer to share um, what the list price is um, in the most recent um, iteration and what the bounds are. Do we have someone from Sanofi on? Hi, this is Julian Ritchie from Sanofi. Thank you. Please go ahead. So th thank you for the question. We are committed to making Bayforta successful and cost effective for all infants entering their first RSV season, consistent with the analysis that you're seeing shared here by UCIP and, and the work group. Assuming an all infant recommendation and inclusion in the VFC program to ensure access for those infants, our pricing will be cost effective with a commercial list price of $495 and a lower VFC price of $395 to reflect that volume that's purchased through the program. Okay, the, thank you. One, and one, oh, sorry, one other point I just wanted to mention too 
is that because there is availability of the product in the two different formulations, the 50 milligram and the 100 milligram presentation, I did want to make sure that it's noted that they will both carry the same price in order to uh, ensure that infants can receive the appropriate dosing without additional cost concern. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Actually going to be my question. So you're saying that the 50 milligram and 100 milligram would both be 495. And then what that means is if you give two doses for the 200 milligram, it would be twice that at 990. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. Okay. Um, and um, I wanted to go back to a point that Dr. Um, Peacock made um, in saying that the CPT code is defined as a drug and therapeutic. And so my other concern is for persons with private insurance, because if my understanding is the ACA covers vaccines, but if this has a CPT code for drug and therapeutic, and we have lots of high um, deductible plans, would there be a large co? Could we anticipate a large copay for many families? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peacock. Are you the correct person to respond, or would you like someone else to respond? Hi, this is Dr. Peacock. Um, so I, I will need to get with um, some of the, the billing experts and we will need to come back with that answer. Thanks. Thank you. And maybe also just, um, we'll, maybe we'll come back to that, but also just to ask if our AHIP colleagues might have comment later as well, just to prepare you. Um, I'll call on Dr. Talbot next. Yes, I actually wanted to comment on the drug and therapeutic also, and I was wondering if this is something that the AMA would reconsider. And I think there are two reasons, there are many reasons, and I'm sure my colleagues will point out more. There were some presented there, and Dr. Paling brought up one. But when you say drug and therapeutic, our, our patients are going to think that this is a treatment for RSV and not a prevention. And so I think that clearly makes it much more difficult when we try to educate families. Thanks. Thank I'm going to um, go to Dr. Daly next. Dr. Daly, we can't, or I can't hear you. Maybe others can hear you. Dr. Daly, you might be double muted. In which case, I'm going to come back to you and we'll go to um, Ms. Stinchfield. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Patsy Stinchfield representing NAPNAP. Um, as a member of the work group, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Peacock, especially for outlining the significant implementation challenges that we discussed in our work group. And um, coming from the private sector, hospital, and clinic setting, I would just encourage all of my uh, colleagues out there uh, across the U.S. to use her very detailed uh, presentation as a template for the work that needs to be done uh, and starting now with the patient education and staff education, storage, handling, electronic medical records. There, there are a number of considerations for implementation, but this uh, these should not be barriers. They just are going to take some work to do now. So I just wanted to say thank you for capturing uh, our work group's uh, work so well. Thank you. Dr. Hopkins. Thank you uh, for representing uh, NFID. I, I want to thank the work group for all their hard work uh, again. And I think my comment comes at perfect time after uh, uh, Ms. Stinchfield's comments. You know, I think the issues around collaboration and communication are going to be so critical with this product and for RSV prevention in infants in general. I would hope that uh, the work to decide how we're going to get this into immunization registries, how we're going to support uh, communication between practices, hospitals, and patients and families knowing what, uh, what preventive tools have been used for RSV will be emphasized earlier rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. C. Slack. 
Hi, thanks very much. Um, I have a question about the cost effectiveness results for children uh, eight to 19 months entering the second RSV season, because I was surprised looking at those numbers to see that the work group thought that these were reasonable. Um, so Dr. Jones, can you explain um, the risk category for the base case scenario and then and then the rationale for apparently upping that tenfold in your sensitivity analysis? Sure, thank you. Uh, the the base uh, the the no increased risk our our baseline risk was based on those that would be entering their second RSV season in October or in the eight to nineteen month uh, age range and and those were per um, uh, NVSN rates so that would be the general population um, because we were considering those that were increased risk. Uh, that wouldn't be the general population, and with a lack of data of what the uh, uh, hospitalization rate would be for these increased risk, we created uh, theoretical risk groups of what they may be. And uh, so the results are now being redisplayed. So this was more the reason the work group did not expand uh, beyond those that are already recommended to get palivizumab. So for those that are recommended to get palivizumab, instead of using uh, palivizumab as a five-dose uh, monthly um, uh, uh, monoclonal antibody product uh, by switching to nirsevimab, they would be assumed to be cost-saving in that scenario. So uh, that is the scenario with which the work group interpreted it would uh, be um, a reasonable and uh, allocation of resources. Okay, thanks. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Dr. Lair next. Um, thank you, Dr. Jones and Dr. Peacock for this presentation. Could you go back to slide 55 for Dr. Jones, one before this one? And you're saying that some people have a higher risk, but you also implied that you didn't have any data. So the people who got pavlovizumab, do you have any data on sense of how much more likely they are to be in the hospital? than the average 12 month or 18 month old? Because that, I agree, it's very expensive if it's not really a significant increased risk. So we are gonna have a second response to the last question that we'll address first, and then we'll move to the response to the question just asked. Hi, this is Dr. Peacock. Just wanted to give you a response on uh, coverage related to the ACA. ACA. So nirsevimab will be covered under the ACA as a immunization with no copay uh, if it is uh, recommended by ACA, ACIP. So thanks. So going back to what is the increased uh, incidence rate of hospitalization or other health outcomes for those that are at increased risk, it's really the lack of data that is most concerning. Um, based on the lack of data and a review of the evidence, the American Academy of Pediatrics for palivizumab only uh, recommends palivizumab in the second season uh, for uh, a fairly select risk uh, group that we'll review those in the uh, next uh, presentation. We tried to, we reviewed that paper, re did the systematic review, and really found a very limited set of data um, that did show an increased risk, some showing um, you know, two times, four times, five times the risk. Uh, our market scan analysis did show higher uh, prevalence ratios of hospitalization, but uh, the work group had considerable um, concern about uh, that whether those represent the truth or not, or if those are inflated due to RSV testing um, of high risk versus uh, the general population. Um, and so it's really with all of the data or the lack of data available of what we were able to find uh, is, the, is, is basically we, we don't have confidence in what those might be. Thank you. And if Dr. Lee, can I comment on Dr. Peacock's um, comment? Please go ahead. So I totally agree that if it's on the immunization schedule, it will get covered without copay under the ACA. I would just simply like to reiterate something I've brought up many times is that takes time. Insurance companies, and I just had to research this for a presentation, have one year after approval and actually have until the following plan year. 
So if we approve something in February of 2023, in February of 2024, the following plan has to cover it without cost. That can be 22 months. If we approve something now, it could be 18 months before it's covered. There are insurance companies that as soon as it is approved by the CDC director, they will start covering it. And I would like to encourage my insurance colleagues to simply adopt that policy because it's in the best interest of our patients and our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Um, actually, I don't know if Dr. Grubb is on and available, but actually, uh, if you are able to comment, we recognize there's heterogeneity by health plan. Um, but as we're moving into the sort of new era of many different things, it might be helpful to just get your input and feedback on this particular issue and whether or not any anticipated changes are expected for the future. We have our colleagues from Ahab on. Perhaps they have, I don't see them on, in the call anymore. So we'll maybe table that question for later. Dr. Uh, Ms. Bata. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Peacock, for that very comprehensive um, review of the implementation challenges. And um, coming from a state health department, I just wanted to highlight um, the the ten percent um, of hospitals that are in on enrolled in VFC, um, and the fact that we've seen a lot of bundling of hepatitis B, but that may be a challenge um, going forward. And with only ten percent of hospitals have enrolled in VFC, this would be a huge onboarding project for state programs to get them um, enrolled in VFC programs. And also um, the challenges of elig uh, screening for eligibility um, and how that would be um, uh, practically implemented are just a, a few of the other things when we're looking at that 10% that we need to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bata. Um, Dr. Peacock, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going, but if uh, there are specific things you'd like to respond to, uh, please we'll collect them up and <laughs> feel free to respond at the end. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Daly. Yeah, Dr. Lee, I'm going to do a sound check first. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about my prior uh, audio problems. So I was actually going to make a very similar point to what Ms. Bata just made. So I will not make that point and move on to a different point. This one's directed at, uh, Dr. Jones, which is, um, Dr. Jones, I, I, I really appreciate the um, uh, additional uh, thought and care that the work group uh, put into whether to include a Native American, uh, Alaska Native in a, in a second season um, dosage. And to me, given the data that was presented on four to 10 times the hospitalization rate during the second season, it's a really compelling argument. But I, I just wonder about um, uh, sort of the aspects of uh, the acceptability and the feasibility of that and whether you have any data to speak to sort of the ability to implement that um, as a strategy. Um, and again, I appreciate the thought that went into that uh, over. We don't have any specific data points. We have been in discussion with colleagues from the Indian Health Service who are free to comment as well. Um, and with CDC's uh, Office of uh, uh, the OTASA office that works with our um, tribal partners um, and are continuing to uh, receive feedback. This is still, um, uh, these clinical considerations are, are being proposed and we'll have our VFC vote today, um, but there's always opportunities to receive uh, more, more, more feedback. Uh, Dr. Clark, oh, thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, this is Dr. Matthew Clark with the Indian Health Service. Um, we are in the process of evaluating the uh, logistical implications of this recommendation for uh, our IHS system of care, including our federal, tribal, and urban programs. Uh, but in light of the, uh, the increased risk to our patient population, that's something that is a high priority. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Dr. Paling? 
Thank you. One of um, the things that Dr. Peacock um, mentioned in our presentation that I think we need to um, be thoughtful about is if an RSV vaccine is recommended for um, pregnant persons, you, um, you would not need both the vaccine and the um, pregnant person in this. And so that will be the first time that um, the vaccine in a pregnant person would make um, what vac uh, vaccines the child received be modified. And so um, we have our AIM colleagues on, and this has huge implication for our immunization information systems. Um, and I'd be interested in how people are thinking about capturing that because ideally having both on the immunization registry would be um, helpful to avoid record scatter and um, not duplicating efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Yep. Or um, Dr. Lee, do you want, I can, why don't I just make a list of these and I'll comment at the end. Does that sound good? That sounds perfect. Yes. Okay. I, uh, and let me just um, echo my appreciation for the amount of thought <laughs> and uh, care that has gone into your presentation. Um, I just did want to make a comment that uh, we, you know, this is a new era <laughs> where we're really thinking about prevention more broadly. Um, and, you know, I do believe that in terms of the innovation of this, this is a really important step forward. Um, and just want to recognize that because this is a new and innovative step forward in terms of prevention activities, that implementation uh, does take time and there are a lot of complexities with this. Uh, this is one of the first products we're looking at in this way, uh, but as you work and we work together to set up how we can possibly think about delivering and implementation systems across various settings, I mean, I do think that this opens up so many more opportunities. So while this is gonna be hard in the short term, it's gonna be of huge benefit in the long term. So really appreciate all the work that and Carrie put into that. Um, that said, I did have one question for Dr. Jones, which is around um, immunocompromised populations. So you presented the information around um, children with chronic lung disease and um, congenital heart disease in the second season, um, and specifically the uh, uh, the, the nirsevimab concentrations um, by that status. Do you have any information on immunocompromised populations? I recognize that the numbers will be small, but any descriptive data could be extremely helpful to understand whether or not at 150 days uh, that uh, that level of immunity is durable for that particular population, recognizing again that immunocompromise can be very broad in its definition. Uh, the company has uh, had a trial, a small trial in an immunocompromised uh, population. I believe it was a safety trial. I haven't seen the pharmacokinetics, if those were measured in that specific population. Um, perhaps I can open it up to uh, Sanofi to, to comment if, if they have any data on that. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Jones. This is Julian Ritchie again. Uh, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Christian Felter. Christian? Yes, thank you very much for the, the question. At this particular time, we are still on, the immunocompromised study is still ongoing. And at this, at this point, we don't have any further data about this particular point. But what we have seen is across all populations that have been studied uh, with nirsevimab, we have noted that the pharmacokinetics is consistent across the across the different populations. We've, we have not seen populations where there are significant differences there. And we know that the duration of protection lasts at least the 150 days and potentially uh, there are signals that it may last longer than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yes, recognizing with passive uh, immunotherapy, this is going to be a really helpful addition, and particularly for that population. So thank you. Um, are there any additional questions? Uh, Ms. Coyle? Thank you. And I, I just wanted to say, you know, representing the immunization information system side of things, I think Dr. Peacock did a fabulous job of outlining a lot of those challenges. I think the one piece that wasn't mentioned, and I want to just put it out there, is that IAS get you know, about 80% of their data from electronic health record systems and pharmacy systems. And they are also a very um, heterogeneous population or group of systems out there. 
And so I think that's the one other piece I would just caution everybody about is there are going to be implementation challenges on the EHR side that I can't even begin to describe all, but it will play out in how quickly EHRs can adopt and uh, put this in their systems to be able to send it to an IIS. So while they might be able to capture it, sending it to the IIS might take a little bit more time. So I just wanna note that for the record as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, I think um, I don't see any other hands raised, but there will be opportunity to speak up again at the end. Um, uh, uh, we'll move on to the next section, which is clinical considerations for under Uh Dr. Jones, the floor is yours again. And um, appreciate Dr. Peacock collecting up all of the uh, implementation questions across the board. All right, thank you. So next, uh, I will discuss clinical considerations and followed by work group considerations for our nursevimab recommendations, and then present the proposed voting language followed by any additional discussion. Uh, next slide. For the timing of nursevimab, uh, provisors should target administration in the first week of life for infants born shortly before or during the RSV season, shortly before the start of the RSV season for infants aged less than eight months, and shortly before the start of the RSV season for children aged eight through 19 months who are at increased risk of severe RSV disease. Now, while the optimal timing for nirsevimab administration is shortly before the season, Nirsevimab may be given at any time during the RSV season for age-eligible infants and children who have not yet received a dose. So based on pre-pandemic patterns, this means nirsevimab could be administered in most of the continental United States from October through the end of March. And because the timing of the onset peak decline of RSV activity may vary by jurisdiction, uh, providers can adjust administration schedules based on local epidemiology. For infants born short, shortly before or during the RSV season, nirsevimab should be administered within one week of birth. Administration can be during the birth hospitalization or in the outpatient setting. And infants with prolonged birth hospitalizations due to prematurity or other causes, they should receive nirsevimab shortly before or promptly after discharge. Tropical climates may have seasonality that differs from most of the continental United States or is unpredictable, and this may include southern Florida, Hawaii, Guam, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and the U.S.-affiliated Pacific Islands. Also in Alaska, RSV seasonality is less predictable, and the duration of RSV seasons is often longer than the national average. Providers in these jurisdictions should consult state, local, or territorial guidance on the timing of nirsevimab administration. In accordance with CDC's general best practices for immunizations, simultaneous administration of nirsevimab with age-appropriate vaccines is recommended. In clinical trials, when nirsevimab was given concomitantly with routine childhood vaccin vaccines, the safety and reactogenicity profile of the co-administered regimen was similar to the childhood vaccines given alone. Nirsevimab is not expected to interfere with the immune response to other childhood immunizations. The following groups of children aged eight through 19 months are recommended to receive nirsevimab when entering their second RSV season because of increased risk of severe disease. Children with chronic lung disease of prematurity who require medical support, this includes chronic corticosteroid ther uh, therapy, diuretic therapy, or supplemental oxygen. This is at any time during the six-month period before the start of the second RSV season. Children with severe immunocompromise, children with cystic fibrosis who have manifestations of severe lung disease. This includes previous hospitalization for pulmonary exacerbation in the first year of life or abnormalities on chest imaging that persist when stable or weight for length that is less than the 10th percentile and American Indian and Alaska Native children. Nirsevimab is recommended for infants aged less than eight months, born during or entering their first RSV season, including those eligible for palavizumab, 
And nirsevimab is recommended for children aged 8 through 19 months who are at increased risk of severe RSV disease and entering their second RSV season, including those eligible for palatizumab. Per the FDA label, children who have received nirsevimab should not receive palatizumab for the same RSV season. And recommendations for palatizumab are made by the American Academy of Pediatrics, or AAP. Providers administering nirsevimab should follow ACIP's general practice guidelines for immunization. Nirsevimab should not be administered to persons with a history of severe allergic reaction, such as anaphylaxis, after a previous dose or to a product component. As mentioned in an earlier presentation, adverse events after administration of nirsevimab without co-administration with any vaccine can be reported to MedWatch, and adverse events or suspected adverse events following co-administration of nirsevimab with any vaccine should be reported to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. An additional reporting of the same adverse event to MedWatch is not needed. So again, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who's contributed to uh, all, all these uh, considerations, recommendations, and gathering of data. I'll move on to the final topic and then open for discussion. So FDA will monitor safety reports submitted by patients, providers uh, to the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System and Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or FAERS and VAERS with an F and a V. FDA will monitor other data sources, including the scientific literature, the applicant's periodic safety reports, ongoing clinical studies, and potential other sources, for example, medical billing and electronic health records. CDC will monitor reports submitted to VAERS that involve simultaneous administration of nirsevimab with childhood vaccines, and will also monitor the safety of nirsevimab in the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD. CDC will leverage existing uh, vaccine effectiveness platforms. The new Vaccine Surveillance Network, or NVSN, is an active surveillance system and for uh, acute respiratory infection at seven pediatric medical centers that can assess effectiveness against outpatient and emergency department visits and hospitalizations. This platform can capture nirsevimab receipt through parent interviews, medical record reviews at the primary care provider and birth hospital, and through state immunization information systems, or IIS. Virtual SARS-CoV-2 influenza or other respiratory viruses network, or VISION, is a multi-site electronic healthcare record-based network that can assess effectiveness against emergency department and urgent care visits, hospitalization, and critical illness. Nirsevimab effectiveness analyses will be limited to integrated healthcare system sites that will have more complete capture of nirsevimab receipt, including through IIS linkage and claims data. CDC will monitor nirsevimab effectiveness throughout the season but end-of-season estimates will likely be most accurate. The power to estimate effectiveness depends on nirsevimab uptake and RSV incidence. RSV genomic surveillance will also be important. Mutations resulting in nirsevimab resistance have been rarely reported. Senefi and AstraZeneca are sponsoring Inform RSV, a global genomic surveillance study in children aged less than five years to monitor evolution of RSV strains, F-protein antigenic sites, uh, and the, those relationships with clinical features of RSV disease. CDC is planning genomic surveillance of pediatric and adult RSV specimens, including whole genomic surveillance. This surveillance will monitor for changes in the F protein that might result in nirsevimab resistance. For the indication for infants less than eight months born during or entering their RSV season, the work group found that nirsevimab is safe and effective in reducing the risk of RSV disease, including hospitalization due to RSV. The work group shared the concerns as outlined at the presentation by Dr. Peacock on implementation considerations. And the work group felt that the use of nirsevimab would be a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources, but many work group members 
prefer a lower cost per dose. For the indication for children aged 8 through 19 months who are at increased risk of severe RSV disease and entering their second RSV season, the work group felt there was limited efficacy and safety data. Additionally, there was limited data on the burden of severe disease in the second RSV season for children with chronic conditions. Therefore, the work group supports the recommendation of nirsevimab being given to children aged 8 through 19 months who are entering their second RSV season for those who are recommended for palivizumab by the American Academy of Pediatrics in their second RSV season, and for American Indian and Alaska Native children, as described in clinical considerations. The following is the proposed ACIP voting language. Infants aged less than eight months, born during or entering their first RSV season, are recommended to receive one dose of nirsevimab, 50 milligrams for infants less than 5 kilograms, and 100 milligrams for infants weighing 5 or more kilograms. And children aged 8 through 19 months who are at increased risk of severe RSV disease and entering their second RSV season are recommended to receive one dose of nirsevimab, 200 milligrams. And I w welcome any questions for the discussion at this time. Thank you. Um, this session is, uh, the entire session actually is now open for questions. Please feel free to raise your hands in the chat and I will call on you. Dr. Lair. Thank you again for a lovely presentation. I have two questions and two comments. Could you go to slide five, please? I just want to clarify that the nirsevimab will not interfere with measles, mumps, and rubella and varicella vaccines because in general, we have considerations for immunoglobulins and live vaccines. So um, you mentioned that on slide five. I think we're working to get there. While, while we're doing that, uh, the, work, the work group had a discussion and presentation on this. Uh, there is fairly limited data um, on nirsevimab being co-administered vaccines and immunogenicity. Um, uh, the uh, per our discussions with uh, expert input from our CDC immunologists, uh, the risk appeared to to be low, and both per the FDA label and per CDC's uh, general best practices for immunization, uh, we felt it appropriate to recommend co-administration of nirsevimab for age um, appropriate uh, vaccines. Um, happy for uh, our. Uh, Natalie Thornburg, Melissa Coughlin, or any of our other experts to um, add, add to this. Uh, yeah, this is Natalie Thornburg. Um, of course, there's not a lot of data. Um, there's not a lot of data with um, co-administration of monoclonal antibody prophylaxis with um, childhood immunization, just because they're not widely used yet. There is a little bit of data for um, infants who have received palivizumab. And um, there's no indication that they interfere with um, uh, vaccine responses. Most of the data that's available for um, co-administration and um, co-administration of vaccines or inhibition of vaccines um, deal with um, uh, live attenuated vaccines. Obviously, in this, this is this product is not a a vaccine is a is a passive immunization product. Um, so the the mechanisms of those inhibitions is not um, relevant to a passive um, a passive product. Thank you. I'm glad that this got looked into. And then just logistically. I would like to sort of give a couple of examples to sort of know what primary care offices should expect. So let's just take a regular RSV season, October through March. So if a baby's born in December, January, February, they hopefully will get the nirsevimab in the hospital. Um, March as well, we'll be hope that they get it in the hospital, but not April. Is that a fair assessment? Based on pre-pandemic um, 
pre-pandemic seasonality, uh, that seems a very reasonable approach that, that we have kind of outlined here. Yes. Okay. And so I've got someone coming in, they were born in April or May, and they're having their well child check in September or October or November. October, I see absolutely I would want to give the nurse Evimab. Is there a date where I wouldn't want to give it too early? Would I not want to give it before September 1st, before September 15th? Would I rather give it October 10th than September 10th? Do we have any information on that or are we just doing the best we can? Well, we did a cost effectiveness analysis comparing uh, various months uh, starting in September versus October, ending in February, March, or April. Uh, October through March was uh, the best cost effectiveness. There may be slight differences whether you live in the uh, southeastern United States versus the west coast as there are weeks uh, difference in pre-pandemic seasonality. Um, but to, uh, rather than trying to, for CDC, give very specific recommendations for uh, jurisdictions, uh, we felt that uh, an average of October through March uh, would uh, be pretty good on, on average for most, and uh, based on local epidemiology, um, providers may wish to alter those administration schedules. So, but just to clarify, for a standard season in a standard location like mine in New York, November would be better than September, is that what you're saying? Hey, may I step in here, um, Jefferson? I think I understand very clearly what Dr. Lair's question is. And because this uh, monoclonal antibody has a, a very prolonged half-life, the timing is not as critical as the day you, you drop the gauntlet and say, it's time to start palivizumab. So the, the major consideration is, will the child be eligible for this RSV season? And how will we best fit that into a schedule of uh, a doctor's visit without adding the cost of another visit? So it, we would not have an opinion if it would be better to do September, October. If you're gonna see them in October and you haven't had um, the, I, the initiation of the season, give it to them in October. But if you're not planning to see them in October, give it to them in September without concern for uh, waning protection through at least 150 days. Thank you. That's could, excellent. I'll save my comments for later. Thank you. Could you uh, go to slide 189 of the ETR slide deck? I mean, I uh, want to emphasize that the trials uh, showed a um, efficacy of 150 days. There is some data that suggests it may last longer than 150 days. Uh, so in those considerations of when to start, here's, here's the, the data. It shows um, uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, in, in blue are those that uh, received nirsevimab, who did and did not get uh, RSV in the, the dark and unfilled squares. And then you have the placebo groups in gray. Those filled-in triangles are those who received, who uh, had confirmed diagnostic confirmed RSV. So you see the neutralizing antibodies even up to day 100, 361 are higher in the nirsevimab group that both who did and did not get RSV than the placebo group who did get RSV. So uh, it's I think it's important to try and uh, time it in our considerations when we talked about October through March that it is. Uh, shortly before the RSV season is the prime time. If you give it too early and while you're in the peak of the RSV season, there is, um, you know, you still haven't given RSV or RSV has, the protection has substantially waned, um, would clearly be less than ideal. Uh, but given this, uh, aiming for shortly before the RSV season and then as soon as possible if, if that's not done. Thank you. Dr. Paley? All right. So um, thank you again, Dr. Jefferson. And I very much appreciate your conversation on the safety and highlighting the fares and bears. And I am aware the FDA and CDC 
collaborate on um, theirs. And so I think this is highly achievable, but I would love to hear from FDA or um, Dr. Shimon Bakura on how there's going to be collaboration because you could report to one or the other um, FAIR or VAIR systems and how are we going to make sure we capture and have a complete picture? Thank you. I, this is uh, this is Tom Shimma Booker. Do you want me to to give a response and then FDA can? Please go ahead, Dr. Shimma Booker. Sure. So <laughs> I I just want to um, just say first and foremost we we work closely with FDA to monitor um, vaccine safety and for for nirsevimab um, the, the the passive immunization we have worked closely with both. Um, the Center for Drugs and uh, the Center for, for Biologics and um, with NCRD to develop a, a comprehensive monitoring approach. And I think as was stated in the presentations, um, a, 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 a re, an adverse event report involving nirsevimab only, um, the, the place or the home for that is the, the FDA's um, FAIR system with an F. Um, and uh, if, if, if there are nirsevimab only reports that get sent to, to VAERS, so essentially reports that are misrouted to VAERS with a V, um, we have a process for making those available um, to our colleagues in the Center for, for Drugs who run the FAERS program. Um, if there are adverse event reports that involve simultaneous administration of, of vaccines and nirsevimab, uh, we consider that a a vaccine report, and um, we will we will monitor those reports, and we also have a mechanism to allow um, our colleagues in the Center for Drugs um, access to to um, to monitor those reports as well. And then I'll also uh, mention that we plan to conduct surveillance uh, safety surveillance for nirsevimab in our vaccine safety data link program. Over. Thank you. And if our um, other colleagues would like to raise their hand and just let me know if you'd like to also respond later, please go ahead. Um, Dr. Paling, do you have any additional questions? I do have a second question. Um, so I wanted to um, thank the work group and um, Dr. Jefferson for sharing the preference for a lower cost per dose. Um, that's something that's been weighing on me hard because as I think about other large diseases that we've tackled, thinking about the original pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and the original um, rotavirus vaccines, which also had prevalent diseases. Those were cost savings um, by original estimate and were uh, subsequently proven to be that way. Um, this is not, this is priced higher. We do understand that this, these have been expensive studies and that the companies need to make their process uh, um, to um, compensate for that work done. But uh, I am worried about equity and I'm worried about um, hospitals saying, well, we have one week to do this. Let's make sure the um, private practices give it rather than give it in the hospital because from a hospital standpoint, the cost differential for a baby born in June and a baby born in um, October or during the RSV season would be 500, almost $500. And that's a big deal. Um, the second thing is I worry about um, the ability of um, exacerbating the rural um, urban um, differential and that locations in rural America would not have access to this. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Gatta, did you want to make a comment around um, safety surveillance? Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I think Tom um, covered it well. If there's any additional questions, happy to, to clarify on safety surveillance. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Sanchez. Yes, thank you. First of all, I want to really thank um, Jefferson Jones, as well as um, Catherine Fleming Dutra, as well as Dr. Peacock, um, really for their wonderful presentations, their clarity, and really um, just all of the efforts of the work group that they've put together. It's been just an amazing group. Um, but I also, um, you know, I think we have to be cognizant that 
we do allow for some local epidemi epi, um, surveillance and recommendations based on some local ep epidemiology surveillance. Because if nothing else that we've learned from COVID, RSV season is who knows what's gonna, when it's gonna start this year. And I think we have to be on top of that. Uh, we really continue, we really do need to continue to monitor local um, epidemiology to see when will be the optimal time to start, whether that's September, October, November, or maybe even January, who knows what will be this year. And we certainly monitor it on a regular basis um, locally. But, you know, I understand the issues of implementation. This is a new, this is a new medication. Um, this is completely, you know, where we'll be giving it to every single um, infant less than eight months of age. Um, however, this really is a huge benefit. And we really, you know, the, the issue for me is, can we get it in time for this coming season, whatever that may be? But, you know, anybody who's been working with Palavisumab and administration of Palavisumab, um, gosh, I think um, we really want this medication. Um, um, and it's just hopefully um, something that we can work through the impl implementation issues because it's something that I think is going to be um, really important um, for for our, all our infants um, coming um, looking forward. So I think that there are issues of implementation, but I don't think they're insurmountable. And really, I think that we just need to work locally to make sure that this, um, this happens as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Sanchez. Dr. Talbot? I just want a clarification. We're treating this as a vaccine so that it can go through vaccines for children. Yet for safety monitoring, it's meant to go through fairs and not bears. So I, I worry, <laughs> this is kind of back to my other comment about the AMA considering this drug and therapeutics. I think we need to make very, um, I think we need to make a lot of efforts to get this termed one way um, to prevent some of the complications that will occur. Thanks. Thank you. I'm gonna go to Dr. Daly next. Yeah, thanks so much. The sound check, Dr. Lee. Yes, you're good. All right, few. Um, so these questions are some detailed questions, I think probably best directed to Dr. Jones. Um, so Dr. Jones, I've gotten some questions from colleagues like um, a kid comes in in December, it's a bad RSV season, he or she is um, eight and a half months old. Um, can they still get nirsevimab um, if they're not in a high risk group? Would that be considered a, an administration error? That's question one, and then I have a couple other detailed questions. Our current recommendations are uh, for as long as they're less than eight months uh, that nirsevimab is, is recommended. Again, if they have the high-risk conditions, as previously mentioned, that's an exception. Uh, but for those, uh, because RSV uh, risk of severe disease goes down over time and uh, the remaining RSV season, whatever it might be, um, by the time they reach eight months is, is less, that we highly encourage um, nirsevimab being given as early in the RSV season uh, as, as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I can see there may be some disappointed families, but I understand we kind of need to draw the line at, at some point. So um, for the second season administration, it's a 200 milligram dose. And so then that would that be two separate injections? Yes, that's from, correct. From there'd be a hundred milligram pre-filled syringe and it would be two of those that would be administered. Okay, thanks. And then, and then I have a communication question and this is gonna be tricky, Dr. Jones, but f can we provide some um, communication to providers about what to say when asked by a parent, is this a vaccine? Um, and if it's not a vaccine, what is it? So I feel like um, those conversations are gonna come up thousands of times and I feel like I'd like to help our providers just figure out what's what's a transparent, honest, and succinct way to answer questions like, is this a vaccine? And if not, what is it? Um, thank you. Thank you. We, we are working on uh, education and, and uh, other materials to help our providers that, that we can provide to them. And we'll be having uh, future webinars, uh, updated websites, um, 
hopefully in the near future. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I have three questions. The first is based on the available evidence. I want to make sure there's no um, reason to believe there would be harm to an infant if there was um, maternal vaccination and nirsevimab was given to the infant. Well, um, we'll generally defer questions referring to the maternal vaccine um, after uh, it, you know, pending FDA licensure uh, of a maternal vaccine. Um, there is maternal an antibody from infection that is certainly present in, in infants, and nirsevimab in the trials is, is given to uh, likely uh, infants that are born to mothers that were infected recently or during pregnancy. But um, any kind of specific maternal vaccination questions, uh, we'll, we'll defer those to a time when, when appropriate. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, as as uh, anyways, the consensus is that there is not thought to be a, a risk for that, though. Thank you. Okay, and if if I'm remembering correctly, in your last presentation, you did talk about the fact that there would be instances in which it would be appropriate, right, for an infant to receive nirsevimab, even if um, the mother was vaccinated. We uh, gave. Uh, early proposed uh, considerations at the June meeting. We'll continue to discuss those, um, again, pending uh, FDA's, FDA licensure of the maternal vaccine. Okay, thank you for that. My next question relates to an information sheet. So similar to a vaccine information statement, what will be provided to parents for infants receiving nirsevimab? So this is Dr. Peacock. So we will have something similar to a vaccine information sheet because it's not a vaccine. It will be called something different, but it will look um, similar to the to one. Okay. And my final question is, as it relates to any potential claims for injury from nirsevimab, what is the mechanism to adjudicate those claims? Uh, for this question, I guess I'd first ask uh, Dr. Grimes from HRSA if he could comment. Yes, thank you. So um, for uh, vaccines, the criteria for coverage is typically for um, routinely administered vaccines, I should say, it's through the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. And that is when a vaccine has been recommended by CDC for routine administer, administration to children or pregnant women subject to an excise tax by federal law and added to the vaccine injury table by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So um, the Vaccine Act that governs the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program um, does not clearly define or does not define vaccine. So if all three of those criteria were met, there is a route for potential coverage in the VICP. Thank you, Dr. Grimes. I have no further questions right now, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you. Um, so, sorry, I just want to clarify, Dr. Grimes. Um, so, uh, if, for example, it is covered under the Vaccines for Children's program, there's no there's no um, limitation to incorporating that in the, for example, the Vaccine Injury Compensation program. Yeah, so the Vaccine for Children program and the National Vaccine Injury Compensation program are um, separate. So just inclusion in the VFC would not um, trigger inclusion in the VICP or vice versa. Okay. I I do think. Uh, thank you for that, and I and I recognize um, you are answering it, um, uh, you know, extremely accurately. <laughs> I just it would be helpful, I think, to know, um, per Ms. McNally's point, uh, the clarification on that when that clarification comes forward, uh, to be able to share that with ACIP members um, and also the public. Um, I actually see Dr. Grubb has raised her hand, but Dr. Grubb, actually, I'm going to uh, take Chair's prerogative and ask one particular question, which uh, relates to some of the work that you're doing with AHIP. Um, one of the questions I really have is around financing of prevention. 
Mike, I think this is also a fantastic product and something that hasn't been available previously and also has many benefits in terms of the durability of protection uh, compared to um, other antibody products that we've used previously for high-risk kids. Um, I did want to highlight uh, the challenges that we have um, in the ambulatory setting, our pediatricians and our family practice docs and the birth hospitals that are delivering these babies um, essentially have been asked to pay upfront for the cost of these uh, products, uh, including vaccines, um, and hope for uh, adequate reimbursement on the other end. And, you know, I want to just highlight that in this instance, you know, coming from the drug side, it is not typical uh, for us to think about um, the pediatricians and family practitioners who are in small practices, for example, bearing the brunt of that upfront cost um, and potentially losing money on being able to deliver these preventive interventions. So as we're starting to move into these, um, you know, again, more innovative strategies for prevention, um, I think this is a plea generally to ask for uh, a reconsideration of where the risk is actually laid. Because right now, um, it is a huge cost um, and um, honestly, a, a disincentive to be able to get people to do the right thing. Um, I think aligning the incentives um, and ensuring or securing the ability to ensure adequate reimbursement, even at cost reimbursement, um, would be um, something that's pretty critical uh, in order for our um, frontline pediatricians and family practice docs and, you know, actually our birth hospitals as well, uh, to be able to take on the financial risk, um, given that this is a significant financial risk for the entire U.S. population of infants being born. Um, so I realize that's a huge question um, that goes beyond AHIP, but I do think it's something that we really need to think carefully about, especially as these products become more expensive. So Dr. Grubb, did you want to comment on the uh, prior uh, questions? And if you're able to comment on this as well, that would be super helpful. Sure. And, and sound check, because obviously it wasn't working before. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. Sorry, I was on my phone. Um, so I think um, just uh, to reference the prior questions, I think um, Dr. Peacock and Dr. Laird, um, and I, you know, you you mentioned that you know this would really be, um, you know, we. Uh, what the ACIP recommends, it would be, you know, very similar to um, the the compliance issues that would go with any other vaccine. So that's the decision, and, and you all covered it very well at the beginning of the call. Um, and I think um, to the larger question, I think that is a, a very, you know, a very important and um, big question. We have a lot of other members of AHIP on the call today, and I think we can take that back and, you know, hopefully um, start along the lines of getting um, an answer. Um, and I think a lot of this is going to, you know, involve, you know, a multi-layered response because um, there's a lot of questions here, like with coding. I mean, they've already been brought up coding, you know, um, reporting, you know, where it's done. And I think, you know, a lot more to come, but, you know, we look forward to, you know, working with you all in the future on that. Thank you, Dr. Grubb. Um, I'm going to move on to Dr. Cotton. Thank you. I have one really small question, and this relates to the fact that this is, you know, passive immunization. We had trouble getting Evusheld into the immunization records um, in Epic, and I was wondering uh, what the plans, if there's been an update, I'd asked that before, um, whether it would be entered into the immunization record or where it will go, because it, there really wasn't a home when we were using the monoclonal antibody Evusheld, um, the paired monoclonal antibodies Evu in Evusheld. Uh, we, we are aware of this issue and continuing to work with uh, both national and internal partners and uh, afraid we don't have any updates as of today. Okay, thank you. That will be a major issue with um, communication and rollout. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do Dr. Paling and then Dr. Fiho first. So Dr. Paling, please go ahead. Okay, so thank you for putting up the proposed ACIP voting language. And so um, I um, like this language, but I recognize that it is time limited. Um, and so we're in a difficult position. Um, because we do know that FDA is reviewing a maternal vaccine. And so the way I interpret this, this language is that if that is subsequently um, approved, we would be giving both. And that is not a decision I'm ready to make today. 
And so my question is, can we, how do we address that? And what is the work group's thoughts on how do we um, think about the, the, what's coming down the pike? Thank you. Uh, should a maternal vaccine be licensed by FDA, we will uh, visit that topic at that time. Thank you. Dr. Freihofer? Oh, Dr. Paley, do you want to finish? Is there a follow-up? So does that mean we would have to meet and vote again? Thank you. Uh, yes, we would have to meet again to, to vote on a maternal vaccine and discuss any uh, implications for under 7 map. Okay, so in the context of a maternal vaccine becoming available, um, this language could be reconsidered at that time if it's impacted by the maternal vaccine, it sounds like. Um, Dr. Freihofer? Uh, Sandra Freihofer, liaison for the American Medical Association and speaking as a practicing physician, I wanted to applaud the work group's recommendation to include giving a dose of nirsevimab to American Indian and Alaska Native children and their second R RV, RSV season. Um, this was on slide 17. And as pointed out in today's presentations, the rate of RSV hospitalization for these children is four to 10 times that of the general population. And as we know, maternity, maternal mortality rates for their mothers is also over twice as high as compared to white women. Also, as a practicing physician, we always hear about VARES with a V. VARES with an F is not as familiar. And I was relieved to hear that CDC and FDA work so closely together to make sure that any reported concerns will be made available to the appropriate agency. And as per CPT coding, earlier this year as AMA board chair, I recently attended the meeting of AMA CPT Advisory Committee and the nuances we talked about today between vaccines and passive immunizations like nirsevimab have been anticipated and these issues are already being discussed. And as pointed out in Dr. Peacock's um, presentation, the issue about it not being eligible for standalone counseling is an important one and I will pass that along to our advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whitley Williams. Yes, thank you. Uh, Pat Whitley Williams, National Medical Association. I'd like to um, thank the presenters as well as um, certainly applaud the work group for their, for their careful um, considerations and deliberations. I just returned from the national meeting of, the, of our uh, organization, which is predominantly made up of uh, African-American physicians. And one of the uh, talks included one on RSV vaccines, as well as um, nirsevimab. Um, it was well received. And I think what's important here is there are both pediatricians and family physicians. Um, it was a mix of academicians and people who practice in the inner city, but also um, providers that uh, do practice in the rural areas. Um, very well received. Of course, questions came up about VFC. Uh, which were addressed, um, as well as um, uh, questions about um, uh, how that, how the uh, nocivimab would be recorded. So I think the, sometimes the registries may not be available in the rural areas. I just want to urge that um, in communication somehow um, that the importance, and I think this has been brought up before, the importance of the first or the dose um, of um, nocivimab be given in the hospital prior to discharge, particularly in rural areas where they may not store um, or may not keep um, nocivimab as part of their armamentarium um, of medications. And then the third thing is definitely the communication about this is not a vaccine, it is a biologic. And I heard that we're gonna be working on that in terms of communications. So again, I thank the work group for their efforts. Thank you, Dr. Whitley Williams. Um, we're gonna move on to Dr. Lair and then Dr. Grubb, I don't know if your hand is still raised and then Ms. Howell. So Dr. Lair. Um, I am looking forward to two years from now when this is all past us. This is a spectacular advancement. It's going to help families and offices and keep kids out of the hospital. And two years from now, it'll be covered by insurances and all the implementation will be in place. 
So there will be growing pains, but I don't want to lose sight of how important this advancement is. With regard to the language in front of us, I'm totally in favor of the first proposal. I am wrestling with the second proposal. It is a very expensive proposal. It is a lot of extrapolation. It will promote equity. I have not yet decided how I'm going to come down on this, but I wanted to at least express my hesitation about the second proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Dr. Long, did you want to respond? Yes. Um, thanks, Dr. Lair, for, for your always uh, thoughtful comments. Um, when you think about the, the second proposal, first of all, um, the groups that are uh, part of the AAP recommendations are already receiving palivizumab, which would be much, 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 much more expensive than this. And the only increase or expansion of the group would be to include the, um, the Alaska Native and American Indians and their risks, and as well as the risks of those that are in AAP recommendations of severe disease, risk of severe disease, not just increased risk of hospitalization, but increased risk of a severe disease, those, those groups were in the six to 10 times greater than the population at large. So this is a very small group of children. Um, we think, uh, Dr. Jones, re, re, tell me if, if I haven't said this right, that it would be well below 1% of the American population of children, eight to 19 months. And they are already costing a lot of money because of palivizumab. And we did not have the data to say that we should remove an indication for passive protection for those who are already um, receiving palivizumab. I don't know if that helps. Um, I'm gonna call on Dr. Jones for a moment to also provide a response. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Long. Uh, just echoing her comments. I was wondering if is the concern um, uh, yeah, for for those who are currently recommended by AAP to receive palivizumab, uh, that second indication we would expect to be cost saving. Um, and another um, consideration for the American Indian and Alaska Native population is there are uh, many areas where uh, if a child gets severe RSV, they require emergency air transport to um, to receive appropriate medical care, uh, which was another um, consideration and in, in, in inclusion. So at this time, our our considerations for that second indication is as uh, Dr. Long uh, just described. Thank you. Um, I had uh, I, I'm actually going to call on Ms. Howell next because I had already mentioned that, and then we'll go to Dr. Paling and Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Uh, Molly Howell, representing the Association of Immunization Managers, uh, which is a membership association uh, made up of the 64 federally funded state, territorial, and city health agencies that administer immunization programs at the local level uh, and actually administer locally the Vaccines for Children program and oversee the implementation of immunization information systems. Uh, as a group, we have been anticipating nirsevimab availability for a while now and been looking forward to planning assumptions and collaborating with CDC and others to overcome the challenges regarding implementation. Uh, I did have one question. Uh, one is regarding the Vaccines for Children program. Uh, currently, for vaccines included in VFC, there is a fee cap for the administration of vaccines. And if added to VFC, will that fee cap also apply to nirsevimab, although it is being classified as a drug and not a vaccine? Thank you. Uh, we'd like to ask uh, CMS if they could comment. Sure, this is Mary Beth Hans from CMS. Um, because it is administered under the Vaccines for Children's program, there the vaccine. Um, administration fee ceiling does have to apply. Um, and 
you know, that is the, the ceiling that a state Medicaid agency can reimburse a provider. Of course, a state Medicaid agency has the flexibility to set that rate um, up to that ceiling. Thank you, Ms. Hans. Um, Dr. Paling. Okay, so first of all, thank you. And um, thank you, Dr. Um, Jones, for sharing that um, we uh, need to do um, this language itself, um, even, and we'll reconvene if a maternal vaccine is approved. Um, I wanted to echo what um, Dr. Lair said and recognize that um, this product has tremendous um, benefit and will significantly reduce the disease. Um, we do have some growing pains with the implementation issue. Um, and when we get through that, there will be lots of benefit. And so I do want to um, make a motion to approve the ACIP voting language as is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. We have a motion on the table. Um, do I have a second? Dr. Sanchez, did you raise your hand to make a comment or would you like to also second? It was a comment, but I'm glad to second it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and, uh, it's been moved and seconded that the uh, two votes um, on the screen here for proposed ACIP voting language uh, move forward when we get to the vote section. Um, but I'm gonna allow Dr. Sanchez to make a comment. I just wanted to re really um, re-echo Dr. Long's and Jefferson's comments um, following uh, Dr. Lair's comments um, about the second season. I, at the work group, we really struggled um, with the issue of who should get it in a second season. Certainly, you know, we're aware of, um, and we discussed, you know, Down syndrome children, um, those with congenital heart disease, neuromuscular disorders, anatomic pulmonary abnormalities, and, um, and really the data are not there during, for, a, for administration during a second season. So we really, and at the same time, what we decided, and I think appropriately, was that we really, these are children in general who are, re are recommended to receive palipisumab for known increased uh, risk of severe disease. And so I think we tried to make a reasonable statement and recommendation based on the data that we have without expanding it you know, beyond that, that data. Um, the only expansion, as has been mentioned, was Native, um, Native American Indian and, and Alaskan children, and those are recognized high-risk groups. So I think that we really um, discussed it a lot. We tried to find the evidence, um, but we really also felt that we could not go back on the current um, polyvisumab recommendations. Um, and so, um, and the other thing that we also discussed was, and would not recommend it during an ICU hospitalizations, but rather at the time of discharge as is currently recommended for polyvisumab. So I just wanted to just comment further and the fact that um, the second voting one aged eight to 19, there was a lot of discussion and we felt that it was best to um, continue the current recommendations uh, for polyvisumab in this, in this group. And it's not for every child with BPD, but they have to have certain criteria in the previous six months. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hopkins. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make the comment that you know, NFID has posted a number of educational materials on RSV and that uh, following uh, the actions of ACIP on Nirsevimab and, and others, we will continue to provide educational materials uh, supporting providers and patients and families uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one little thing before um, Dr. Daly and Dr. Peeling. Um, ask their uh, questions. One is uh, just in terms of uh, the, is there a minimum interval um, between, uh, for kids who might be eligible in their second RSV season? And I only ask because if they happen to be born sort of at the end of season one, but you wanna protect them through season two, is there any recommended uh, recommendation or consideration regarding, like it's at 150 days given the durability of immunity or is longer allowable? 
So there is no minimum interval. So based on pre-pandemic seasonality, if uh, a high-risk uh, infant were born at the end of March, then it would be approximately a little over six months before the beginning of October when the second R season would, would start. Um, uh, but there's no, um, uh, we, we haven't said it has to be at least some duration should abnormal RSV ac activity occur. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Daly? Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Lee. Um, so I have two comments, one's about equity and then one's about implementation that I'm going to direct to Dr. Peacock. With respect to equity, I want to bring up some points that Dr. Paling made about 45 minutes ago. I think anytime we have a new uh, product available, we run the risk of actually making health equity worse or inc increasing inequality. And I think we're particularly susceptible, susceptible to that here because of the challenges. So we have this great opportunity to improve health equity, but I think with sort of every one of these decisions, we need to think about if you're coming from a more disadvantaged situation, Dr. Whitley Williams also mentioned that you're living in a rural part of the country, et cetera. This may increase barriers and then that may really have adverse effects on health equity. So I think we need to be sort of conscious of that in every one of our decisions um, that we make moving forward. So then the second comment is around implementation. <clears throat> So, Dr. Peacock, I really appreciated how <clears throat> how detailed your discussion of the challenges are, and I would just summarize that by saying, you know, this is going to be hard, but that's okay. We, we we can do this. We can work through these challenges. But, Dr. Peacock, what can we do to help with those challenges? Are there issues that we should talk about here in public session? And I think the broader public health community, we're here to help work through all those challenges because. We just need to recognize them and work through them, work the problem. And, and so again, I'm aware of all those challenges and I wanted to ask about them, but then you covered it so well, but just let us know if there's stuff we can talk about here and let us know what we can do to help solve those challenges. Thanks. Um, thank you, Dr. Daly. Uh, Dr. Peacock, I'm actually gonna um, ask if uh, Dr. O'Leary can go next and then if you can respond, because I know you've been collecting up um, different comments over the course of the session. Um, and then we are going to move on to um, Dr. Santoli after that. So Dr. O'Leary, you get the last comment for this part of the session. All right, thanks. Um, first, I just wanted to thank Dr. Daly for bringing up that issue, as well as Dr. Uh, Jones, Fleming Dutra, and Peacock for these, these really excellent presentations that that covered a lot of our concerns um, at the Academy uh, regarding the implementation of this new product. Um, you know, again, along with everyone else, we're very excited about the potential to, pre to prevent uh, so much of these hospitalizations. Um, one of, we are working a lot internally, as well as uh, working with our partners in the federal government and state and local governments to uh, really focus on this issue of equity as we roll this product out. So. There's, you know, a lot of the things that were covered in Dr. Peacock's presentation uh, as, as potential implementation and issues and barriers. We have uh, uh, folks at the AP that are working actively on those right now. And so we'll be working on our communications as well as uh, helping to uh, uh, craft implementation guidance for our partners with equity as a very clear focus. So thank you for all of your work on this. And I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. Um, Dr. Peacock. You actually get the last word. <laughs> oh, sorry, we had a mic issue, um, or I had a mic issue. So, um, you know, I appreciate all of the comments and the recognition that that implementation is going to be challenging. So, I think one of the things we need to do is recognize that this is. Um, it's a new and very exciting uh, product that we are working through all of these things, and this is going to be a transitionary season. And so uh, thinking that through, I think some of the things that you all have done here is bring up some of the really important issues related to insurance, related to coding. I think also the issue around equity. You know, Vaccines for Children is really an example of a program that has very successfully addressed health equity issues over the last 30 years. It provides access to not only children that are Medicaid, uh, that are on Medicaid, but also children that are under or uninsured, um, as well as uh, 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 Native American, uh, Alaska Native children. And so 
Um, you know, all of these considerations are very important, and I do think that we're going to need to work hand in hand with um, vaccine providers, with physicians, with nurses, with others that are involved in this, as well as our um, uh, health departments to to make sure that we continue to think about how are we going to provide um, access, as much access as we can, both in this implementation time and then as we move forward. And so what this season looks like may be different than what it looks like in a couple years. We know with hepatitis B, we started um, with a different recommendation and eventually hepatitis B is regularly given in hospitals. Um, what we may see in the rollout um, you know, in the near term, is that more of this is given in an outpatient setting. I think we're going to have to see um, how we balance all of these implementation issues and work with you all to, um, you know, make sure that as much access as possible for young infants is going to happen because it is, you know, stepping back, this is a really exciting moment. I know any of us who have taken care of children with RSV, I remember back in residency admitting, you know, 20 kids in a night that had RSV. I mean, this is really an amazing time. And so I think if we all work together, we will figure out um, some of these implementation issues. Thank you so much, Dr. Peacock. Um, with that, I think we're ready to move on to the Vaccines for Children Resolution. Dr. Jeannie Santoli, the floor is yours. Thank you. Next slide. So um, we're bringing forward a new resolution for your consideration. The purpose of the resolution is to add the, to add the monoclonal antibody preparation Nercevimab for infants to prevent RSV disease to the VFC program. Next slide. In terms of the eligible groups, the first is infants aged less than eight months born during or entering their first RSV season. The second is children aged 11 to 19 months as noted in table one, which we'll see on the next slide, who are at increased risk of severe RSV disease and entering their second RSV season. This is table one, showing the children at increased risk of severe RSV disease. And this actually mirrors uh, information that you've seen in prior presentations during this session. Next slide. The recommended vaccination schedule and dosage intervals, the table below summarizes the immunization schedule for administering RSV monoclonal antibody during the first and second RSV season. I'll give you a moment to look at this. This also mirrors the discussion that we've been having this morning. Next slide. For recommended dosages, we will refer to product package inserts and for contraindications and precautions, we also refer and provide a specific link for package inserts. Next slide. Finally, uh, there's a included in this resolution, as in other resolutions, there's a statement regarding an update based on published documents. So if an ACIP recommendation regarding RSV prevention with nirsevimab is published within six months, Following this resolution, the relevant language above, except for the eligible group sections, will be replaced with the language in the recommendation and incorporated by reference. And that concludes the overview of the proposed VFC resolution. Thank you. Um, do any of my colleagues have any questions for Dr. Santoli? Dr. Long. I, I think maybe um, you miss, not you, um, Dr. Lee, but I think maybe you misspoke or I misunderstood. Uh, for the second season, it's eight to, to 19 months, not 11 to 19 months. Is that correct? Could we go back a couple of slides? 
It says 8 to 19. I heard 11 to 19. I apologize if I misspoke, but the and slide then, is correct. The, thank you. And in, in, I think it's slide 11. Can we look at that one again? I, I, I saw something I had not seen before about six months prior to the start of season. Next slide. No, that was it. Go. go. It's this one. Okay. Any time during the six month period before the start of the second season. Oh, I'm sorry. That's six months intervention. I thought I'm, I again misunderstood this one. I thought you were stating that you could give the monoclonal antibody six months, as early as six months before the start of the season. It, it, it's perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Palin. I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Santoli. This looks identical to what we've seen, and I like um, the final one, um, anticipating that there's a potential resolution that could be coming in the following six months. I think this is why. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Uh, yeah, could you go to slide 10 for a sec? Um, so it, I think it's the next one. Yeah. So uh, I thought the wording of the timing, I, I know what's intended here was slightly um, unclear to me and to the newborns. Um, so I wonder if we could just sort of work on that um, timing. I think we, we know what's intended, but I found that a little bit um, less than clear. Thanks. Yeah, we, uh, the we, we could work on the wording of this timing to reflect what was in the other presentation, which we updated. Um, we'll, we'll discuss for, for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just confirm, congenital heart disease is somewhere on that table, correct? Just to confirm my <laughs> understanding, they would have been included in a high risk category. Sorry. Um, is so uh, congenital heart disease per the AAP recommendations is not included for those in their second RSV season, only for those who are included in their first RSV season. And the red book appears to be pretty specific about that. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Dr. Cotton. On this slide, could you clarify what children with severe immunocompromise means? And will there be further definitions provided? Well, I'll start, I'll actually open this up to Dr. Long as well. We initially gave examples um, of what severe immunocompromise might mean and discussed uh, uh, severe uh, SCID or, or uh, hematopoietic stem cell therapy, lung, or, or, uh, lung transplant. Um, but there was concern that if we were over prescriptive about that, that um, there may be groups that really do qualify and listing every single situation may uh, make those who, who really should qualify otherwise not. Uh, Dr. Long, do you have any comments on this? I don't have anything further to say. I, as you know, Dr. Cotton, because you take care of these patients, the person who knows this best is the person taking care of the patient. And we just, because this is also, you know, very young children, and they would be very unique, almost surely. They're not great big groups of uh, certain kinds of transplant patients, for instance, so that um, the immunologist would always be involved with taking care of this kind of a child, uh, and uh, they would know best. Okay, I, I would actually advocate for clinicians to have some type of guidance, but then I would leave sort of a more open clause with, as well as other children deemed to be severely immunocompromised by their care team. I do think clinicians have been clamoring for fairly specific guidance from the CDC regarding immunization recommendations as it can be hard to fully understand what the recommendations mean. So from my perspective, I think 
further guidance could be useful. There was outstanding guidance provided by the CDC during the COVID-19 pandemic regarding the definition of who is moderately to severely immunocompromised. And that has really um, been uh, changed the field um, for the better from my perspective. So I would just um, consider providing additional input there. Thank you. Thank you. I also just want to echo Dr. Cotton's comments. I do think in the um, clinical considerations, it would be extremely helpful to have at least some uh, big picture guidance on that. Um, and also just, you know, acknowledging uh, and understanding if, if for any reason there would be differences uh, across different vaccine products, or in this case, um, uh, immunoglobulins uh, or passive immunotherapy, that that, that would be uh, the rationale would be helpful to have, perhaps in the general guidance, <laughs> but at least for this particular product and the clinical considerations. Um, any any additional questions or comments? Okay, I don't see any additional hands raised. So um, with that, we will go. Oh no, I do need a I do need a motion. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, Miss Good. Um, yeah, I just had one clarification question, and I think it also pertains when you go into the vote, is the recommendation for the second season, is it implied and understood enough that they shouldn't have received a dose earlier, or it can they have had a dose at less than eight months and then come into a second season and get a second dose? Dr. Jones? So the recommendations are independent, so you certainly can... If you qualify per the recommendations as laid out and received nirsevimab in your first RSV season, then the recommendation is to get nirsevimab in the second RSV season. If for some reason a, high uh, a child at increased risk of RSV disease did not get nirsevimab for some reason in their first RSV season, or they're entering their, yeah, for this upcoming season, they wouldn't have received the first dose, then they would um, uh, uh, be recommended to get nirsevimab. The FDA label, uh, does specify that those who uh, received palivizumab in their first RSV season can receive nirsevimab in their second RSV season. Um, so there is no disqualifications for the second RSV season related to what did or did not happen in the first RSV season. And, and I just would add, this is Sarah Long, that <clears throat> I, I, I'm sorry that it is a little confusing, but we wanted to be sure to not use um, the word second dose for people to think you needed one, more than one dose as you did with palivizumab. So they're independent recommendations and one doesn't preclude the other. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Dr. Paling, you're muted. All right, I have a request to put the um, resolution on the screen, please. Uh, was this for the VFC resolution or for the initial proposed language? VFC resolution, I'm sorry for not being clear, yes. That, so all of the slides combined are the VFC okay. resolution? Okay, so it's not one slide. Um, so I would like to make a motion to accept the resolution with the clarification in the table as we've described. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Um, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Uh, Dr. Sanchez is seconds the motion that's on the table. Um, with that, it's been moved and seconded that we accept the VFC resolution um, as discussed. And with that, I believe we can uh, move on to our break. I'm going to ask if we can return at um, the top of the hour. So it'll be, I believe it'll be 2 p.m. East Coast time. And uh, we'll see you then. Thanks everyone for your work. <laughs>